Magnetism is a concept that uh, chemists understand on one level, um, paramagnetism, diamagnetism. Most students, though, are just familiar with magnetism and what they're thinking of is something called ferromagnetism. I have a very strong magnet here, a neodymium magnet, and to prove it's a good strong one, I can show you that it does a number on this little test tube clamp. Um, relatively few metals are ferromagnetic, that is, that strongly attracted to a magnet. That's something that students don't necessarily realize. They see a magnet being attracted to the refrigerator and all these different things, and they figure all metals are magnetic. For example, I've got uh, four coins here, and the question I have is which one of these things is ferromagnetic, that is strongly attracted by a magnetic field? So, you can make your prediction. It turns out that not a single one of them. Actually, nickel used to be, and I think some Canadian nickels still are, but uh, no, all, none of our coins contain the three metals that are ferromagnetic in them, and that's iron, nickel, and cobalt. If you look at their position in the periodic table, those, those three, iron, cobalt, and nickel, are just the right size and just the right electron um, properties, unpaired electrons in fields, that they have that incredibly strong, and I mean thousands of times stronger, attraction to magnetic fields. So it doesn't look like any of our currency is at all influenced by a magnetic field. Well, that's not necessarily true. Do I have a dollar bill somewhere in the audience? Oh, here, good. Jennifer? Thank you. Unlikely candidate for something that would be ferromagnetic, but if you hold it kind of limply like this and bring the magnet up to it, you can definitely see there's something ferromagnetic about it. So it turns out that there is iron embedded into the ink. And that's a process that's done intentionally. It's kind of hard to reproduce for counterfeiting. And I'm sure there's some here in the dark part around the George Washington's face there. So there's iron there. Would it be possible to extract that iron from the dollar bill? Well, let's give it a try. Um, we're going to get some water here. Okay. We've got a blender, and I think a blender is certainly goggles worthy. I certainly put on my goggles every time I use the blender in the kitchen. And uh, don't you all? No, okay. Um, so Jennifer, there you go. Going to, uh, I know you don't object there. It's, I'm just going to be increasing your liquid assets, right? As, I heard she was having a cash flow problem, okay? I'm just trying to, no, sorry. Okay. This is going to take a while. A dollar bill is not like a piece of paper. You know that because if it goes to the laundry, it comes out nice and whole. And I'm not talking about money laundry in there, but that just does happen. <laughs> so we're going to blend this for a while, um, two, three minutes, but because uh, it takes that much to extract that iron out. <laughs> Okay, we've let that blend for about three or four minutes there. It's starting to get a little wet as the lid was a little loose, but um, that's a nice little slurry. I guess if we had taken time to carefully mass out that, we could uh, say we made a one dollar solution there. Okay, sorry, but um, let's see if we can extract out that, uh, that oh, that's beautiful. Extract out that iron. So, when you do this, you want to use a plastic spoon, not an iron one. So, I'm going to hold the, the uh, magnet here and just kind of give it a little gentle swirl, okay? And you'll see a nice dark bit of iron. Is that showing up there? I can, I can maybe make one of those little magnetic faces out of it with the beard and stuff now. Okay, so quite a bit of uh, iron in a dollar bill. Um, you can do the same thing, by the way, with some cereal, total cereal, um, or any cereal. And uh, actually, I think you get more out of a dollar bill than you do out of a bowl of total. Well, next time, if you're 
you know, don't have time for breakfast and you know you need your iron, you just swallow that dollar bill and it'll probably get into your digestive system. So there's that little bit of iron. Now we're actually going to lift it up out of the solution. Okay? There's more in there, I'm sure. But it could, we don't know if that's cobalt or nickel. We know it's very attracted to the magnet. It's not a mild attraction. So we're going to do a quick little test here on that. Maybe you know this about it. I'm going to dissolve the iron in some HCl. I've got some concentrate HCl here to make it go faster. And a good test for the iron three positive ion is to react it with a thiocyanate ion because it produces a complex ion, the iron thiocyanate two positive. I've actually got the five water molecules in the other positions there um, in the octahedral arrangement uh, in that model there. Nice little picture of that. So let's test for this. So first thing I need to do is put on some gloves here, handling the concentrated sulfuric acid. I'm mean, sulfuric, sorry, hydrochloric acid. It's always a good idea to wear gloves. And uh, there we go. And it doesn't take much to run this test. So I'm going to use the spoon to just scoop out that. If I use the magnet from here, I'd have trouble um, getting it off the magnet. So I have it there on the bottom of the beaker. Is that showing up? Yep. Not all of it, just some of it. And we're going to dissolve it in the hydrochloric acid. Okay. Now, iron is almost colorless. It has a faint yellow color, and that's already showing up. But the definitive test is to add the thiocyanate. This is a solution, one molar potassium thiocyanate. And as soon as I add that, you'll see a definitive blood red, beautiful. So that's the uh, complex ion there. I could dilute that down because it's almost too. There, is that better? blood red, definitive test for the iron three positive. So there it is. There may not be gold in them there hills, but there is iron in them there bills. Thank you. <laughs>